and to have the opportunity to bring together um, a few, um, four uh, really interesting practitioner artists, scholars um, from Chicago. So uh, this is part of a, a, a an organization I, I run that's called the Indeterminacy Consulting Group. And me, Sandy Bobel, it emerged out of many years of running a festival and uh, the scholarly work I did during my PhD. And the intention here is to collaborate with artists, academics, and practitioners across disciplines to design performances, lectures, and educational seminars. It's intended really to be a laboratory um, where we can test ideas that are often at the edge of their disciplinary expertise and a place for experimental exploration and to design new strategies and methods for living in our current historical moment, which is um, unique in the way that education and learning and ideas might perform themselves in our everyday. Um, so tonight I'm pleased to present this new event series uh, called Redisciplining, How to Rediscipline in the 21st Century. And tonight we'll hear four directions on this curatorial theme, which starts with this. Today, we have too much anxiety and not enough influence. Many of us place a great deal of pressure on ourselves to be original. With so much emphasis on finding and promoting oneself, there is a lot of anxiety. Um, psychologist Samuel Bessier contends, there is plenty of rigor, but it is pointed in the wrong direction tells us, quote, too much time, effort, and intention are being dedicated to being or finding oneself, lacking mentors and role models, and without a script, path, or rituals to live by, an individual's mind and affect and actions run amok aimlessly, end quote. To help us rediscover these models, we can learn from living scholars. These are individuals who have first trained and achieved mastery in a disciplinary field and then gone beyond that training to improvise their ideas in an interdisciplinary mode. This process of returning to what one knows, but in new and unexpected formulations, can be called redisciplining. Tonight, we will hear from four practitioners engaged in this process, uh, not in this order, this is just alphabetical order, but Adelaide Mares, Julian Terrell Otis, Spencer Parsons, and Ben Zucker. But in the order of presentation, we'll have what is it going to be? <laughs> did you did you did you decide? Yeah, it's, going, yes, it's going to be Ben Ben Zucker. Ben, 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 ben Parsons, Julia, as an actual reverse alphabetical order. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, with that, I, I look forward to, to 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 these different indeterminate takes on redisciplining that we'll hear tonight, and then to to a, a discussion between um, ourselves um, and with with our presenters uh, afterwards. So thanks. Any communication is a matter of trust. A mutual contact that we are going to share in our means for the common goal of exchanging a degree of epistemological satisfaction, known generally as intelligibility. Even when the communication is one sided in structure, such as a typical lecture we have here, besides being talked to, expect that a framework of intelligibility will encompass the speech access received. In a lecture, 
the idea seems to be that those spoken to will submit themselves to the structure as made legible by disciplinary and social convention. <coughs> what I have done since this has started is, at its least charitable, played my prior hand too early and blown open some of the tendencies that may give this all away to make the exchange incomplete in its satisfaction to short circuit understanding in another exchange for e easy immediate affect. That is a vote of gimmickry. But again, that is the least charitable approach. Not only to me, but to the work gimmickry can do, more on that later, and to your ability to actually do the important work of extrapolating meaningful experience, which is only just indirectly related to the satisfaction of legibility. Consider instead that I am doing some earlier legwork of priming you to a new network of coherence, founded on the insights of incoherence and productive failures of conventional expedient communication. An alternative sort of openness to dimensions of speech, time, and sound, and um, as they relate to the meaning of the words I say. This is, of course, directly correlated to, say, the power of song and the ineffable aspects of vocal uniqueness, but those whose pockets just arrive as song as their implicated music. What I want to propose is our encounter with this. I uh, thought to start from the very beginning. Any questions? I agree entirely. <laughs> By forcing these these connections that have been enunciated silently uh, and not reasonably corresponding it to anything that came before, it is an excellent way to transition to what I want to say next. start with music, we simply thought, is to consider thought movement in time and space. We take a movement of thought through and into or onto being a ground of possibility, not only from extant literature, from the Neoplatonist defense of Parmenides, to modern interpretations such as Ehlers and Kananda's thought freaks and thinkers, but also as a base from which, apart from those sources, what we will compose with right here. I will compose it aloud and occasionally compose with you aloud, and you will compose in parallel, and it is the magnitude of this trajectory of composing that will be the standard of the success of this exchange. Okay, let's see how far we can take it. Despite that spatial metaphor, let's start with time first, and especially as bifurcated between so-called regular time and musical time. Among others, philosopher Henri Lefebvre asks as part of his rhythm analysis, does musical time coincide with lived time, or with imaginary time, or duration, metaphysical, metaphysical or metaphorical time, page 16, continuous publication. He later answers this question by saying, the relation between musical time and the rhythms of the body is required. Musical time resembles them, but reassembles them. It makes a bouquet, a garland of bullet rum, 64 in continuous mm -hmm. essay. This bouquet is the inherent multiple of polyrhythmic cycles Neared in all body practices, many of which he goes on to note are in some form of arrhythmic disarray caused by the imposed conditions of modern life. Conditions. Consequently, we may gather that musical time does not coincide with lived time, and thus that its effects are underutilized or underobserved. So one way we might observe this here is the very fact that language itself has a rhythm whose meaning is only partially contingent on said rhythm. I say partially contingent because the construction of phrases does in fact depend on the spacing of words in time, e, the sip, the bulls are depend, dint on, in place to gather stuff that a guest felt can, and what happens when we go the other way, rapping and chanting or some way we say, language enhanced by a more even or Euclidean division of time that brings us closer to the rhythm of the body while paradoxically taking us farther from the norm or the reasonable. There's no discussing the phase, the fact that when spoken differ, rent, we, they come across, me differ, rent, we to do the rep, for I, 
we prioritize being a syntactical or semantic, such as IE, weatherism, or meaning is more im, for since this does not escape contextual factors either, what we associate with the ways of speaking matters, from the possibility of and definite history of cringe if I had tried to keep, keep rapping at the beginning, or the fact that I have been using the rhythmic profile of rhythm cannot make exercise in repetition bolero incessantly during parts of this phrase. And from those different meanings, the collaboration of understanding and thought begin to emerge as one musical entrance. These are factors not traditionally addressed in traditional Saussarian or Piercean models of semiotics. Except that we consider the dimension of the interpretant to involve perceptual dimensions of time. Instead, consider this an extension of structuralist semiotician Roman Jacobson's poetic function in sem semiotics, where the syntactical or technical elements of a message's construction are reoriented or projected onto the level of their organizing principle. That is, the left, that is, the principle organizing the left to right movement of addresser, message, and addressee. Those techniques are then what is called projected and flipped to how we then might apply those to the interplay of context, message, contact, and code as it is the content of any given statement or speech act. Time and rhythm here may be considered part of the code elements that when projected onto the act of the addresser and addressee becomes contextually important in their own right. The fact that we are virtuosically considering not only what we say, but how we say it as part of the message. In 1968, I ran into Steve Lacey on the street in Rome. I took up my pocket tape recorder and asked him to describe in 15 seconds the difference between composition and improvisation. He answered, in 15 seconds, the difference between composition and improvisation is that in composition, you have all the time you want to decide what you want to say in 15 seconds, while in improvisation, you have 15 seconds. His answer lasted exactly 15 seconds and is still the best formulation of the question I know, unquote. What's brilliant here about this account of saxophone of Steve Lacey as told by the pianist composer Frederick Jeske is that it reflects a basic principle in concept of realization. Things take as long as you give them, just 15 seconds. Message identities, outcomes change dramatically. This is why elevator pitches are just as important as speed cell presentations. They are both forms, that is, sets of durations and events, that is, rhythms that define how much we put into their space and which become subsequently rendered as a whole. Actually, to be overcome. Logic inhabits how we take in written words all the same. This is an extension of an argument made by Adriana Cabrera-Ronian. Implicit in the circuit Cabrera mentions is space. Implicit in this double circuit of reading, seeing, hearing, is a matrix of interpretations from multiple levels of interference, from sound waves mixing together, of listening and understanding, of meaning-making processes, of overlapping of meaning-making processes, in a shared space, of a shared space of the interference of listening and understanding. We return then to an issue of polyphony, of counterpoint. <coughs> what I would like to return to for the first time is the possibility of encountering novel counterpoints of thought, as they might appear if we hijack the space of this auto-effective circuit. What does this hijack look like? Consider Nancy Holt and Richard Serra's Boomerang. Yes, yes I, 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 I can, I can hear, hear my, my echo. echo. And, and uh, the, the, words the words are coming, are coming back, back on, on top, on top of, of me. Uh, the, words the words are spilling out, out, out of my head, head and then, and then returning, returning into my, my ear. ear. It's, it's uh, 
lower. It is perhaps profoundly ironic or troubling that, that while the metaphor of a plurality of voices is desired in discourse, an actual plurality, or even just a double voice, creates the aforementioned interference. What's especially interesting, though, is how Nancy Holt comments that hearing it slows down her thinking. By replicating the subject of her speech, the words, the act itself, become stretched over an imagined time, not just a jumble, but a proportioned garland, and one that proceeds only because of its newly doubled consequential state. Holt goes on to mention, sometimes, I quote, sometimes I find that I can't quite say a word because I hear the first part of it come back, and then I forget the second part. My mind is stimulated to new direction by the first half of the word. This is the whole source of interest in the classical fugue, for instance. We see the original idea introduced, developed, and reintroduced. In the midst of such reintroductions, we consider where the original idea has gone, what has come of it since that first deployment, and we perceive it as a theoretical distance. Seeing something from farther away or thinking something from farther away reminds us where we are currently and where we could go. Or consider the old-fashioned game of telephone. Typically in playing it, we make the inevitable transformation, the inarbitable transformation, the inarable transportation, the interrobatal transcotation, theory of model trans to state in, theory of all chance to stay in, the presence of entropy in communication. A point of interest, uh, of mere amusement for the resulting difference. Yet, of course, the exact same mechanism became the foundation of the exquisite corpse technique of the surrealist, who used the space between creative subjects to rend vast theoretical distances in the space of a single page. Exquisite corpses are not quite like fugues, fugues, excuse me, but they are musical in that their content is guided by formal and proportional considerations. Everyone gets the same space as a page in which to create, rather than the content itself. And thus by doing so, I need someone to finish that sentence for me, that by doing so, That's not what I always said either. And it's not what you have either. Say I called upon you. This is basically me asking you to say something in 15 seconds. Maybe this is all a bit too self-evident, or you might think it's ineffective, or ridiculous. But that is also the reason why you should take it seriously. 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 It's not over yet. There's supposed to be a record scratch sound effect there. Of course, maybe this is all part of the plan. Maybe it is just a gimmick. And I mentioned earlier, though, that gimmicks we can do important work. I draw here upon the writings of Chicago's own Cien Nagai, who posits the gimmick as a form which simultaneously does too much work and too little work, saving cognitive labor while straining to get your attention to ridiculous acts. The gimmick goes on, she says, to expose uncertainties about value bound to labor and time. What is the worth of me doing such short little performative gestures in the middle of a pseudo-academic talk, itself a gimmicky structure of promising information in a recognized form? Is this just sort of cynical, lazy, or self-defeating? <coughs> or is this a form of a counterpoint, a mixture of communicative registers and time scales whose relations speak to the actual point? Is this like boomerang, using that gap between the appearance of these registers to slow down our thinking? And thus, if thinking takes a different amount of time in a new rhythm, now more than in an instant, or in 15 seconds, or in all the time of the world, does that make it a fundamentally different mode of producing thought? Does it in fact alter what and how we sense? This is what I want to try and propose here. Modes of exchange based not on the need for efficiency in preset times, but taking advantage of how musical structures outside of lived time as they work and restructure what we think and possibly think. 
More communication in literal counterpoint, or with the recapitulation of developments in grooves and silences. Sure, it might be more confusing on the surface, but paradoxically, needing to listen and to assemble thoughts in real time actually further embed us in where we are, with the people we work with, or are teaching, or are playing with, or just plain existing with. I only present it to you here as daily fix as it is to break the ground. Eventually, if we apprehend these, com these composed forms of time and space and language enough, we might need not only to pay attention to the fact that it is happening in a different way at all, but the specifics of what that form is and its collapse into the content and as content itself. Our communicative, communicative compact, instead of an exchange, becomes a collective structured improvisation for the shared goal of creating unique, highly localized Tools to do so are baked into our reality already. And in one case, in this case, musical experience is primed to take it all up. So thank you for letting me throw this all out here. Hello? Oh, here we go. Excellent. Hello, uh, my name is Spencer Parsons, and I teach at Northwestern University, and I make horror films. And um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our own work. We need to, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the technology may make this a little tortured. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm here kind of to, to sp speak generally and uh, a little bit more off the cuff um, about uh, you know certain problems that come up in uh, in horror filmmaking and in horror storytelling and actually in narrative more generally. And the, one of my interests in, uh, in in horror stories is that actually uh, you know horror is um, very traditionally a, a, a genre going back uh, at least within the West to uh, Greek tragedy uh, that is about how we deal with the unknown and how we deal with the way that the, the, the world is arrayed in particular ways that are not necessarily always good for us. Uh, there is um, <coughs> a way of thinking about this uh, related to one of the scholars who I'll be quoting uh, excessively throughout this, Eugene Thacker. Um, he poses uh, a sort of notion of the world, uh, the world for us, uh, the world in itself, and the world without us. There are these three different things, and the world for us is obviously this, what is what is here for us in and of ourselves, and the world outside of us, you know, the, the, the world in itself, is this thing that we cannot quite comprehend, um, but that actually also includes other people. Uh, it is a frightening thing, but it does include other people, and that's why we have to have that third category that is sort of beyond uh, this sort of numinous that includes people to the world without us, which is uh, sort of the most uh, frightening of all. What do we make of this? Why would we deal with, uh, with, with such frightening things? I'm going to begin with a scene from uh, the first of uh, the Conjuring series, which you may be familiar with. I don't know that I have to explain the plot too much. The plot's pretty simple. There are ghosts, uh, things that go bump in the night. Uh, but this one scene, I think, is a particularly important scene in cinema recently, um, and a particularly important scene particularly in horror cinema. So uh, let's take a look at this first and then I'll start to get into the lecture proper.
noticed about this scene, uh, even in the midst of a little too much wine and beer, more ghostly visitations. Um, uh, one of the things you might have noticed is that uh, there is actually nothing that can be seen in that corner. The most frightening thing about this scene is, uh, is not what we uh, can see, but what can't be seen. One of our characters is saying, he's right behind you, and we can't see it. Um, in most horror films, you would start to see something there. Uh, but this is one that is d uh, distinctly withholding uh, from us. Um, but this is not necessarily a, uh, a pattern that the movie follows, unfortunately. I wish that the whole movie could function uh, in, uh, in, in as um, extreme a way as this, this scene does um, in embracing its sort of darkness. Uh, Sam, do we have it up and we can go to the next? Yeah, so this is our opening slide. So I'm calling this talk Fool Around and Find Out, Fantasies of Mastery Desi and, and uh, Denying Mystery. Uh, so one of the things that a typical horror film does, uh, and we'll go over how The Conjuring does this in a moment, uh, is, is that it, it is actually a fantasy of mastery. We think of horror as being uh, a genre that scares us, and sometimes it is, but it scares us for a distinct period of time, after which it gives us a fantasy of mastery in which the monster is dispelled. Uh, people can master something, and this is something that, that tends to make the genre, on the whole, quite conservative. Uh, I think, but there is another way if we are willing to go down uh, what is actually a scarier and less comforting path. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, uh, Eugene Thacker, who I, I mentioned earlier, uh, in, in, uh, in, his, in his book, In the Dust of This Planet, uh, says, as H.P. Lovecraft famously noted, the oldest and strangest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is the fear of the unknown. Horror is about the paradoxical thought of the unthinkable. Uh, so this kind of fear, fear of the unknown is embracing the unknown, but it's unknown, so we can't know it. This is why it's unthinkable, uh, and actually why, uh, why it's frightening. Uh, next slide. Uh, so th this was the sequence that we just saw. If we can skip past this, Sam, or is the computer going to let us? Good. All right, so etymologically speaking, that which is a cult is something hidden, concealed, and surrounded by shadows. We find this literally within this scene. Um, and this is the end of the scene that was not included in the, uh, uh, in the clip as the door slams. Um, so the word occult, this is something that uh, is, is actually growing in prominence again, and I'll come back to this point again a little bit later. Uh, but people are thinking a lot more about the, cult, the, uh, the occult these days uh, than usual, and there's some interesting reasons for that. Uh, but the etymological uh, you know, origin is in this notion of the, the literal dark. Uh, what is the dark? Not just the dark arts, but the things that are sort of uh, beyond our perception. Next, next slide. Uh, however, uh, that which is hidden implies that which is revealed. Um, however, next slide. That which is revealed is the hiddenness of the world in itself. As I was talking about earlier, the world in itself is this thing that is very much apart from us. And these kinds of films uh, kind of deal with this. But this hiddenness is also, in a way, hideous. Uh, we often reveal simply that there is more hiddenness beyond the hiddenness, um, that there is more mystery beyond the mystery, if we really, if we really delve into this, that there is, there is this world that is, is sort of beyond uh, our perception, and that is what this, um, this genre is built to wrestle with. Um, that said, next slide. We have, oh, we can't quite see this figure. Uh, I'm going to describe her. Uh, we'll see some notes here in a moment, but this ghost uh, here is a figure named Bathsheba who appears in The Conjuring, and she's the main ghost uh, within this. Um, the Conjuring definitely deals with the darkness, but it deals with it for a certain amount of time, and ultimately it has to find answers. Next slide. Uh, narrative closure resists hiddenness. Now, uh, narrative has been given a bad name because of precisely this practice. This is a common narrative practice, but it's not necessarily the only way to do narrative or how narrative can work. That we, you know, expect narrative closure to give us particular kinds of answers. And in the case of The Conjuring, among the answers we get, demons are real. Now, this is just as literal-minded a kind of uh, assumption as demons are not real, and yet, uh, often the paranormal is uh, suggested uh, in, in movies to be the realm of the more open-minded. This is, in fact, quite a, a literal and closed-minded thing. Uh, demons are real. Next slide. 
Witches are real. Next slide. Witches conjure demons, so they will possess mothers and make them kill their children. Uh, the conservatism here is not just in a general narrative sense of we are going to achieve a kind of closure that is ultimately uh, uh, you know, sort of comforting to the audience, but uh, can be quite literal within the story uh, and in the conjuring. Uh, that's certainly no exception, and uh, we find this out. Next slide, the conservatism goes even crazier. Only Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic rituals can expel the demons. That is in the mythology of the conjuring. Uh, next slide. Scientists and authorities cover this up. We're never really told why. Uh, there's not really a very good motive ever presented, but scientists and authority figures are always covering up the fact that the Roman Catholic Church rituals are the only way you can get rid of the demons. Seems like everybody in the world of these films is on, you know, Team Demon, uh, and, uh, and the pre they're preventing the good people, the Roman Catholic Church, from expelling them. Next slide. And finally, the fictional Ed and Elaine Warren are here to help. They know the secrets they're going to tell you. Now, I really love the Conjuring movies because they always scare me. On the other hand, Ed and Lorraine Warren were dangerous con artists who pretended that, that there was a paranormal uh, kind of stuff so they could go around to people's houses and make uh, money off of books uh, that were about, you know, real life hauntings, that uh, the basis for which was uh, quite often, uh, you know, kinds of abuse in families, mental illness, uh, drug abuse, etc. cetera. Uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren in real life, not really great people, uh, using myths of the supernatural and myths of the Roman Catholic Church uh, and its mysteries uh, to overcome the supernatural. Uh, but in the movies, the fictional Ed and Lor uh, Lorraine Warren are amazing, and uh, they're the ones who are here to tell you the truth and expel demons and overcome the scientists and authorities who cover all this up. Next slide. So, we have narrative closure here as a fantasy of mastery. One, you know, you can see all those different points of what's real and what's not, uh, and who can take care of things. This is a way of ultimately mastering the world. Uh, that mysteries are there to be solved in a certain way, but not just that they can be solved, but they can be uh, mastered and overcome within, you know, a brief period of time. Now, a lot of narratives work in this way. Uh, however, I'm going to suggest uh, here at this point that in the world we lived in in the last year, we've known about, for instance, the cause of uh, coronavirus for some time. Uh, we actually knew about the cause of it from the very beginning, and it has been a very, very difficult uh, problem to try to solve. That we are, you know, I am vaccinated. I'm talking to you without a mask on right now because I'm vaccinated. Vaccinations are real. They start sort of solve the problem, and yet we have a, rule, a, a world that is um, much more damaged and much more damaging to us as a result of this thing that we couldn't control, and where, um, you know, regardless of the science, regardless of our knowledge, we have not exactly mastered the situation. And I believe that storytelling can give us a sense of uh, how to deal with how we don't master the world in every kind of situation. Next slide. Um, so, uh, George Hansen in his book, The Trickster and the Paranormal, says psychic abilities, the paranormal, and the supernatural are fundamentally linked to destructuring, change, transition, disorder, marginality, the ephemeral, fluidity, ambiguity, and blurring of boundaries. In contrast, the phenomena are repressed or excluded with order, structure, routine, stasis, regularity, precision, rigidity, and clear demarcation. Uh, and you can see that within this statement, we have the structure of your average uh, Conjuring movie, at the very least, and many horror films. That we begin with all this stuff that is flux, and we end with precision and rigidity and solving the particular problem. Uh, we also, you know, uh, deal with, uh, next slide. Uh, Hansen goes on to say, when entire cultures undergo profound change, there is often an upsurge of interest in the paranormal. During the breakup of the former USSR, there was an explosion of paranormal activity throughout Eastern Europe. Healers and psychics featured prominently in the media. This should not have been a surprise because anthropologists have shown that the supernatural has figured in thousands of cultural revitalization movements. Again, we are dealing with a time when the occult has become a lot more popular. To the left here, we have a TikTok witch. Uh, the occult is very popular on TikTok, not just as fun, not just as horror videos, but actually as a venue for witchcraft. Now, why might we be turning to witchcraft in this particular moment? Next slide. Well, for one, we have the answer here. It's been stressful recently. <laughs> the world is not yours. You want answers. You look elsewhere. The authorities failed you. We've, we've actually dealt with a year of 
you know, on the one hand, uh, I'm not necessarily for the narrative of Ed and Lorraine Warren knowing better than scientific authorities. On the other hand, we've had systemic failures of authority in the last year, which have sent people toward other ways of thinking and other sorts of solutions. We look elsewhere. Next slide. Let's go back to H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft uh, sort of uh, uh, pioneered a kind of horror referred to as cosmic horror, which is about this sense of how we are really tiny within the universe. We look elsewhere and we find Cthulhu. Uh, next slide here. Uh, I, I'd like to refer to this kind of move as the Lovecraft mistake, and I mean it on a couple of different fronts. There's a mistake that the characters make, which is that they go into the mystery and they try to solve it and they discover how much the universe actually doesn't care about them. And the universe really, really doesn't care about them because here are these gigantic monsters uh, that, are, that are sort of revealed as, uh, as part of the world. Uh, now, on one level, that's the character's mistake. The characters have stumbled uh, into the knowledge that usually will drive them mad if the monsters do not uh, you know, consume them in some way. Uh, but they stumble into this knowledge of how much the universe really doesn't care about them. I also think of this as the Lovecraft mistake because Lovecraft, as an, as an atheist, suggested uh, a universe without God and then put a lot of gods in it. Um, it's a really interesting thing uh, that he still can't, you know, he proposes this, this notion of the fear of the unknown is the most important, and yet he puts a name, a face, and a whole lot of tentacles. Uh, Cthulhu and very other Yog Sothoth and lots of other monsters from the beyond uh, into that. Now, I'm not anti-monster exactly, but I do find it kind of interesting that, um, you know, in Lovecraft's move to dethrone God, he finds that he has to replace God. Again, because of this idea of a certain kind of mastery, of needing to know something, of needing to know something that you can understand. He says that the characters can't understand it, but it's usually, no, no, it's this tentacle monster. Uh, that is the, the, the that is totally evil and uh, and out to get you, um, and uh, and that's that's the thing that you live with. That said, uh, usually things do not turn out particularly well for H.P. Lovecraft heroes. Uh, they run into these monsters. They are destroyed by them. Uh, next slide. Now let's think about something that's going on right now uh, in our world that is actually causing quite a lot of interesting con uh, consternation right now. Let's get into the idea of the unknown and the unthinkable. Let's particularly think about what goes into our, our sense of UFOs. We're getting, we're about to get a big report from the government. We're about to get a big report from the government that may tell us actually something really important, and a lot of people will deny that this is important. What I expect the government to tell us is, yes, UFOs are real. They are not going to tell us, yes, they are also aliens. They're going to tell us there are, there are unidentified flying objects. Yes, that is true. I think this is what's coming. I could be wrong. Maybe they won't. Uh, maybe it will continue to be this thing. But there's been a lot of leaks, and we're getting the sense that this is part of the leaked material from recently. So we're about to find out there are these unidentified flying objects. But people are going to be are going to feel like something was covered up because they're still going to be called unidentified. Because we can't quite deal with the unknown and the unthinkable. Next slide. So let's think about this from the perspective of the weird and the eerie. Mark Fisher wrote a book called The Weird and the Eerie, uh, which sort of defines these terms, and I think these are actually quite useful terms uh, for thinking about the conundrum of what if we find out that yes, the unknown is real. That's, that's a tricky sort of thing. Aliens are real is a comforting thought. The unknown is real is actually a much harder thing for us to deal with. And I think we're about to be dealing with this in a really interesting way. So let's talk about the weird. Next slide. The weird is that which does not belong. Next slide. If it is here, then how we make sense of the world must be wrong. Confronting the unknown means we've been making sense of the world in the wrong way. Uh, next slide. The weird thing is not wrong. The weird thing is simply itself. The weird thing represents the world in itself, not the world for us. Next slide. Our perception is what's wrong. Next slide. This, uh, this all comes from uh, Mark Fisher's The Weird and the Eerie. Now, uh, the uh, explanation that lots of people have for this, and this may be true. Um, again, it's unidentified. Uh, I hold open what unidentified means is it's unidentified. We don't know what it is. However, a lot of people 
people say, therefore, aliens. Why? Well, simply because aliens are one of the least implausible answers in terms of what we can imagine. However, we're limited in our imagination. Uh, we come up with, therefore, aliens as the answer to this. I've had a, a number, since, you know, obviously I'm into the UFO thing. Um, I've had a number of conversations about what this could be since uh, these videos started appearing. There are lots of very interesting answers that you can come up with to this question over a few beers. Um, you know, what is, what is this? What does it mean? What, like, where is it from? Uh, there's a possibility, for instance, it's unidentified. What if this is natural to the earth? What, what if this has always been here? What if that's an animal? What if it's an animal we just haven't been able to see and understand? Moves too quickly, does weird stuff. However, easy to go, therefore aliens. We have, we have lots of, and therefore aliens is a, is a phrase used by uh, a couple of paranormal podcasters in Australia who I listen to a lot. They, they, on the one hand, they're into the paranormal. On the other, they don't suffer fool, fools gladly. And they will often answer someone, oh, therefore aliens, uh, when that is the explanation. Next slide. All right, so the X-Files, uh, we all know, and this poster, I want to believe. This is, this is part of the aspect of therefore aliens that's really interesting. We, we are invested in believing in certain kinds of interpretation. How and why does that work? Well, let's uh, resort to Mark Fisher and the Eerie. Next slide. The eerie is constituted by a failure or abs of absence or a failure of presence. It's a little bit like the weird, but it's a little bit like the opposite of the weird. The weird is the thing that doesn't fit. The, uh, the eerie is more like a failure of this thing's not, it's distinctly not supposed to be here, or this thing is distinctly supposed to be here. And it's, it is or it isn't. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a failure of presence or a failure of absence. Uh, hard to wrap one's head around. Uh, but I think it's a really interesting distinction. Next slide. Uh, there is something present where there should be nothing. And next slide. Or there is nothing present when there should be something. Okay, so great. So in, in this, we come into this world of what we want to believe. Whether it's aliens, whether it's God, whatever it is. Um, and I'm not uh, counting out any particular answers. Uh, again, it's unidentified. It's unknown. Let's truly sort of uh, deal with the unknown. We have an interesting issue here that we want to believe. We want to believe particular kinds of things. And um, I'm going to take this from, uh, from the, uh, the, the, you know, a certain kind of speculative uh, to something that is um, uh, very real and gets allegorized through the speculative. So let's go to the next slide, and hopefully this will work. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you've seen They Live by John Carpenter. Uh, this is a terrific movie in which Rowdy Roddy Piper plays a homeless man who discovers these glasses that allow him to see the takeover that has occurred on Earth and in which all advertisements have kind of, you know, hidden messages behind them. Uh, so, for instance, Marion reproduces what's actually behind Come to the Caribbean. Um, and, uh, and we find a number of, uh, you know, aliens that are, that are sort of running the show. There's a way in which uh, you know, we're, we're allegorizing this moment of discovery that there is, uh, there's a specific answer within the movie, but there is something beyond the, the, the surface. Next slide. Um, and uh, so these are the aliens from They Live, and uh, th this is how they appear through the, through the glasses. Uh, Mark Fisher says, the weird and the eerie allow us to see the inside from the perspective of the outside. This is, this is the really key thing uh, that we get uh, from, from horror stories in a way, is that they shift our perspective. They shift things around. We sort of, they show ourselves to ourselves in a way by allowing us to see inside from the perspective of the outside. Uh, the thing that is out of place throws us out of place. Uh, and, and through this, this kind of move, uh, you know, horror stories can uh, sort of deal with the unknown in, in some interesting ways. Uh, so next slide. Okay, so this is um, uh, this 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 is um, uh, another frame from uh, from this film with uh, all all the the advertisements transformed into their real messages. Obey, obey, work uh, perform by all this kind of stuff. Uh, now. Mark Fisher brings this down to Earth in talking about the weird and the eerie. He says, capital is at every level an eerie entity, conjured out of nothing. Capital nevertheless 
exerts more influence than any allegedly substantial entity. Um, and in the history of capitalism, we talk about the invisible hand all the time. What could be more ghostly than an invisible hand? Uh, capitalism exerts this, um, this enormous force. We might think of it in certain ways as, uh, as, as part of the, uh, the world in itself. Uh, now, I included other people in the world in itself. There are lots of complicated forces that come together, including those other people that make structures, capital uh, being one of those structures. Next, uh, next slide. Now, here's an interesting thing, and this is really, really important to me about uh, storytelling generally, but horror stories in particular. This is not from the film. This is a meme from the last year produced um, in response to the disease that we've been living with. Um, uh, and so we find uh, that someone who is a fan of the film has uh, created this, this sort of uh, you know, New York corner with obey, it's not the flu, uh, practice social distancing, fear, take your shot, stay home, do not, uh, do not question authority, wear a mask, wash your hands. Uh, very, very interesting. And I want to point out that like, this is not an altogether wrong reading of this very same film. Made by someone who is very much working in a way politically that would be aligned against some of the ideas that are suggested here. This is part of the world in itself that includes other people. Um, and uh, so Mark Fisher goes on. He says, the metaphysical scandal of capital brings us to the broader question of the agency of the immaterial and the inanimate, the agency of minerals and landscapes, the way that we and ourselves are caught up in the rhythms, pulsions, and patterning, patternings of non-human forces, a non-human force like a virus that then affects us and makes us behave in particular ways. We also have you know, the, the basic sense, even before the virus came along, of what was going on. So what's interesting to me here is that the ambiguity of the reading I am going to pose is not a bug, it's a feature. It's dangerous that somebody can read they live in the way that they have to turn things around. But this also shows ourselves to ourselves in a way. For those of us who wear masks, and I have my mask, uh, and I've been wearing it today, I stayed home, I got vaccinated, I learned how to wash my hands. I've done all this. This kind of thing shows myself to myself. And it shows myself to myself on the basis of a movie that I really like, I really admire, and says particular kinds of political things that I agree with. This is tricky. This is dangerous. But this is also necessary uh, for how we get along in, in a society and how art can, can function. And why I think that this sense of the unknown uh, it, you know, is really, really important in, uh, in narrative, in being a more radical uh, kind of force for the way that we see the world. Next slide. So, um, let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about how this sort of, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about is the idea of fooling with the unknown rather than like really embracing the unknown or contending with the unknown or confronting the unknown. Uh, we have the, uh, fantasies of mastery and there are various types of these. Uh, characters discover truth, then they defeat the monster. That's a fantasy of mastery. Kind of gone over that a little bit. Monsters allegorize real crises and their solutions. Artists communicate truth to the audience. Uh, that is a fantasy of mastery on the part of the artist. Uh, the audience reads the correct truth in the artwork. This is a fantasy of mastery on the part of the audience. The audience now uh, has a fantasy of mastery by uh, taking on and reading the work correctly seeing exactly what the meaning is supposed to be, uh, rather than, for instance, admitting multiple meanings, and not simply that it is ambiguous, but there may be radically different ways that people can read uh, the thing that is actually supported by the evidence of the text or by the experience of it. Uh, this, again, tricky. Uh, the audience with the correct truth is better. So uh, one of the problems, I'm very much, you know, I believe all art is political, and uh, I'm, I'm very much for political art. I like Brecht quite a bit. Um, but but there's, there's an interesting kind of move here that I, I, I want to suggest, um, and that I think actually, uh, you know, Brecht in showing, uh, in, in, in building things and for structures is, is making us think in highly complicated ways uh, in, in drama, uh, you know, politically. Uh, but the audience with the correct truth, the political reading that is the right reading, 
believe themselves to be better, superior, smarter, etc. Am I superior to the person that made the meme about not wanting to wear masks uh, when we both read they live? I am going to pose dangerously. No, I am not better. And my understanding of the multiple readings can in fact be part of understanding that person, trying to get at like, well, what's the real problem here? What's the real problem that has been brought together uh, by a number of people and by capital, for instance, here? Um, so in the end, we find that, that hide hideous hiddenness is hidden. Uh, yet again, we don't want to deal with it. We get away from it by having this fantasy of mastery. So the next slide, and I'm going to end by suggesting a slightly different way. I, I suppose it, it's sort of, uh, I, I apologize that this is a kind of thing where I'm going to give you this, uh, a very simple solution and scamper away here, but I want to suggest to you that what I'm suggesting here is the most complicated part of the whole thing. I've actually given you a big fantasy of mastery in explaining all this stuff, and now let's open things up. So if we're going to really confront the unknown, let's think about fantasies of experience. Let's think about narratives that present fantasies of experience, things that you go through, and that then you've got to figure out. Fantasies of behavior. How is it that other people behave? How might our fantasies of, uh, you know, that, that are enabled in narrative actually show us how other people behave? Show us, you know, these little hints at the, you know, the world in itself that is outside of us that we cannot possibly fully know. We can only go on the behaviors of others. How do we watch them? And finally, fantasies of the social, fantasies of the spaces that are in between people that are highly chaotic and highly unknown, much as we think we might know them. Um, and so to this end, I wanna show uh, a, a, a film here. Um, we'll, we'll switch up to YouTube again. Um, I am a really big fan of reaction videos to uh, Two Girls, One Cup, which you may or may not know about. Now, I'm gonna explain part of why I'm a fan and part of what this is pointing to. I have never seen the video that these are a reaction to. I never plan to do so. I have heard that it is completely disgusting. And on the basis of what you're about to see, you can pretty much assume it's completely disgusting. I am more captivated by what is captured in this reaction than I could possibly be by knowing the original thing. It would ruin it. It is good for me to leave two girls, one cup in the realm of the unknown. Not simply because it is disgusting. I've seen plenty of disgusting things in my life. Um, I was a certain kind of American teenager. I have a Travis Bickle mohawk right now. Believe me when I say I'm up for disgusting. That's not my reason. It's because I embrace and I confront this particular mystery. So I ask you to watch this now in the spirit of a fantasy of behavior, a fantasy of the social, a fantasy of experience. What are these people experiencing? How are they behaving? What does it tell us about them socially? There's an entire plot. There's an enormous story in this, a big beginning, middle, and end. And I'll let, uh, I, I will exit and let everyone watch this amazing video.
My name is Julian Terrell Otis, and it is not without a rich community of family, friends, and artists that allow me to speak here today. Getting to this point has been an exploration of the performing arts in a broad sense, and Chicago has been a vibrant source of creative adventurousness among the theatrical, dance, and music communities. Each one has taught me lessons that I take with me as a vocal improviser. In the chaos of the moment, there is narrative. In the riding of the wave of time-based actions, patterns emerge, develop, and disappear, generating experiences, and through practice becomes a special language between actors. Relationships emerge, and through that lens, we come to better understand each other. At its core, I'm looking to better understand myself through these relations and find connectedness to humanity. Living in this moment of collective tragedy and distancing social isolation has made the urgency of connection so paramount. Communities need to convene with each other, create new myths that communicate new social relations. In order to do this, we need to hear hear each other, to see each other, and to take up space. Resolve, critiquing contemporary music through improvised performance seeks to be a personal reclamation of music's ability to be a tool of ideation and critique of itself and all institutions. It is a meeting point, a convening of parties, and a sharing of practices between scholars, musicians, and policy debaters, high school, college policy debaters. These three communities provide unique ingredients to the creative pot. In scholarship, we locate the research lens of critical race theory to view our creative field. Policy debate provides the link between the academic and music worlds by providing a vehicle for the academic content but also being a type of music in the delivery of the words. The oration is sound material. 
Engaging musicians in these worlds provides the material to navigate through improvisation and respond in expressive terms. And by immersing ourselves in the study of critical race concepts, it allows us space and time to apply these frameworks in our lives. In the industry in which we work, and ultimately in how we respond to each other in the music. A quick timeline of the project includes a research phase. Here, I will engage in major texts and peer-reviewed articles in the field of critical race theory, CRT, including works by Derek Bell, Robin D'Angelo, Kimberly Crenshaw, and Richard Delgado. I also hope to serve as a debate judge at the Urban the Chicago Urban Debate Tournament to foster relationships with coaches and debaters, reimmersing myself in the memory of the past activities, because I was a high school debater when I was in school, in order to reclaim that experience, that's field work. Next will be the formation of a group. I plan to convene a critical race theory reading group for Chicago musicians in collaboration with guest speakers. From that group, I'll select eight musicians and two to four debaters to engage in musical workshops. In these workshops, we'll gather musicians and debaters to commune and share practices. Debaters will showcase a demonstration debate, and musicians will play short sets in between speeches to respond to the debaters. Pairing debaters and musicians together to create improvised works using critical race theory texts. From these workshops, I hope to compose and co-devise structured improvisation using a mix of CRT text, original prose, composition, and movement-based instruction. With rehearsal and public presentations taking place in the spring of 2023. In order to realize this project, my current needs are for a scholar to lead a critical race theory reading group so that I can ideate on the dismantling of structural racism within our musical institutions. A workshop residency to convene musicians and debaters in exploring oration as sound material with musical improvisation. And suggestions on partnerships, where to set uh, the work for presentation. I thought about using empty schoolhouses, for example. To close, here is just one possibility of a combination of or oration as sound material combined with using the voice. So the first clip, uh, which you can queue up right now, is actually taken from a New Yorker article on critical race theory and classical music, and it's just me reciting the text, so. Black composer standard in the edges of the limelight somewhere earlier in 1893, the young composer and singer Harry C. Burley befriended Anton Dvorak, who had come to New York to serve as the director of the Progressive Minded National Conservatory. Served by Burley singing of spirituals, Dvorak declared that black melody should be the foundation of the future of American music. Dvorak declared that black melody should be the foundation of the future of American music. Dvorak declared that black melody should be the foundation of the future of American music. Dvorak declared that black melody should be the foundation of the future of American music. Dvorak declared that black melody should be the foundation of the future of American music. And the long view the marginalization of the black composers and musicians was not the only immoral wrong, but a self-inflicted wound. In the long view, the marginalization of the black composers and musicians was not only a moral wrong, but a self-inflicted wound. Classical institutions succeeded in denying themselves a huge reservoir of native-born talent. The voice acts acknowledging that African Americans were in the possession of the singer body and musical material, one that broke open European conditions of harmony, melody, and rhythm and went largely unheeded. recognizes the speech patterns that I was used to hearing when I was in high school debate. And ultimately, I want to combine this experience of using the words as sound material with the second clip that you can cue up and adding musical instrumentation to that to see how can we respond to the text using our, using our instrument, which mine is voice. So using a looper, I was able to loop over the text that you just heard. In 1893, the young singer and composer Harry C. Burley befriended Anton Dvorak, who comes to New York to serve as director of the Progressive Minded National Conservatory. Story by Burley singing with spiritual to Dvorak declared that black melody should be the foundation of the future of American music. Black melody should be the foundation of the future of American music. Black melody should be the foundation of the future of American music. Black melody should be the foundation of the future of American music. 
take you through how I got there, and not just this piece, so that this will be very um, briefly in the beginning, but um, I was intrigued by this story of, you know, trying to find your path, and my path has been strange for sure, or weird or eerie, or all these things, <laughs> and there, there are some surprises in there that I have not quite understood myself, but I think there might be um, intriguing to see. So this is actually from a text I wrote after something very strange happened within the work. And so the highlighted piece is something that I have experienced and you will see in a moment that um, any given work of art um, considered in the context of its maker's oeuvre is likely to be both a preparation for later works and a recapitulation of previous works. Um, it's quite well known that artists keep repeating themselves and these repeat cycles are each time a surprise and as um, work goes on, it, it changes in tone. So, so I have broken it down into four cycles, and 
is in each cycle I understand something which then enables me to move on. So this one goes from 1980 to 2011, so it's a very long time, 1980 is when I entered art school, and 11 was when I had my first enormous aha moment, with a lot of work happening in between. Next. So this was um, in, 20, in 2000, when I had gone through various um, explorations, I had made sculptures, I had made light installations, and I had this incredible urge to make diagrams. And I had, with the light installations, you know, kind of gotten a career going, there was a piece in the MCA, I got residencies, I got recognition, and then I could not resist the urge to diagram books. It was crazy. What had ever happened in the light installations was incredibly intriguing. I had um, people interacting with each other. Everything I did felt like a prop. And um, I wanted to go more behind the scenes. What was happening? What were the discourses that happened in the arts? Why aesthetics? What is this? Next. And I had thought about the box in the Billy Duchovsky's piece and said, maybe that will help me explain to myself what I did if I just create an overview. So this is the overview, and I circled the first piece and the last so you can read them in zigzag. The first one is something I did in art school in my very first year, and the last one was one of the diagrams, and they looked the same after I had arranged it. I said, what is happening here? So next. And what I noticed was that this very first piece was actually a diagram, a sculptural diagram, after a book my high school art teacher had given me, um, after Benjamin Lee Ward playing, which brought reality. Incredibly intriguing, changed my life on the relativity of language and grammar. And the last one is a diagram on Ellen DeSemayakis, what is art for? And so this was not on the context, the content, but it was just a formal similarity that made me realize I have always been making diagrams. And through this entire era of making modular sculptures and light installations people could enter, I had worked out formal aspects of diagrammatics. I had no language for it, none of my teachers ever pointed it out, even though where I come from, I went to the school, um, the Kunstakademie Düsseldorf, so you just voice was the teacher there, he made diagrams, but there was nobody making a connection between the pieces I made, and that because I did not work with content that explicitly. Next, please. So diagrams was the insight. Next. I tried then to figure out what that is. Did I have to do something else now? Was I becoming a reader? Did I have to quit the arts? Was my career over? And um, somebody introduced me at this time to um, Willem Flusser, a Czech writer, theorist, media theorist, poet, um, wrote about his own exile. And he had, among many other things he wrote about, told this story how media, um, succeed each other, but contain the kernel of the previous. So the left and the right are really the right thing. The left kind of like a grid, and the right one a series of images, um, one from a series of images I made. And so the very simple story is there we have facts, like a stone, we have images, like a picture of a stone, we have concepts, like the word stone, and then we have models of stones, which might be a taxonomy, and each of those contain the previous in their story, but it's an expansion of how we are able to think. And so these are connected, the image is connected to myth-making, the concepts to the ability to think historically. And then once we are thinking in models, we are thinking in terms of games. And that made a lot of sense to me that my diagramming was part of the game. It was a picture that came after language. It took words and reimagined them in a new way. Next. So I played with games, right? <laughs> I was in the art world. I didn't have a position. Nobody else was doing anything like I was doing. You know, serious, <laughs> not ironic, trying to figure things out, debating all the time. So I made a game about the art world. And it was distributed throughout the school. I was teaching at FAIC already as an adjunct at the time. And so you could roll dice and you could take on a position and you would be able to tell a story from that position. So if you're the parent, of an artist and you're going um, to an art museum or to a bar, how do you talk about art? And so people were playing these roles through and it was quite intriguing, next. That expanded into trying to game out organizations. What are these places that keep giving you all these rules, right? Behave like this, no, you can't have more money. Insurance, not for you. <laughs> so something big was going on. So I mapped out arts organizations so everything was about the arts because the arts was all I knew. I went to art school and then I taught in art school and then I had a residency, so that's my life. So this is the Rockford Art Museum and um, I asked people at the museum to tell me stories. I used their websites, which of course are also already an organization diagram. Next. 
And I made a really large one a while later of the Hyde Park Art Center. So in Chicago, you know the Hyde Park Art Center. It was the takeover. It was the new um, exhibition. And there, I very explicitly wanted people to be able to place themselves. So this was created also as a postcard, so I could hand it to people as a postcard as they could see it. And then I had buttons made in these colors, so you could see I am working in operations. I am on the board of directors. I'm an artist. And so people played with this, and you know, they, then they got drunk at the opening. It was even more fun. And all these flowers are actually photographs of everybody who works at the Hyde Park Art Center. So people were in there, but they were celebratorily in there. So that kind of work netted me a job. Next. <laughs> so I am now a tenured professor, but where, right? I'm in the Department of Arts Administration and Policy. I did not know that such a thing existed at the time it was suggested to me to apply for a position in there. I was very surprised I got it. I had tried for others, I didn't. And this is all part of the story, by the way, right? The professional piece, how you are sustaining yourself, um, what it is like to be precarious. And so there was this moment where to some people it makes sense that an artist at an arts institution who is interested in organizations and how they function should have such a position, which was wonderful. It was a great opportunity. Next. This was truly material I needed to learn, but in the second cycle, I didn't become an arts administrator, but I learned, after I learned about diagrams, I learned about instruments. So that's the next piece. Next. I went to conferences. I wanted to learn about the field of arts administration. I was extremely interested in policy. I went back, I had lived in the United States at this point over 20 years. <laughs> was it that long? Yeah. And so I went back, you know, I'm from Germany. What are the assumptions in cultural policy? They are very, very different. And so I actually was able to frame these things that I had grown up with and that were, you know, kind of indeterminately present. So I went to this conference and I made a drawing on the air, air, uh, back on the airplane and then I thought, what do I do next? So I started to mail it to people at the conference. Like, give me responses to this. I need a conversation about that. What is going on? And I got some responses, and it was nice. Next. I did it more intentionally. I joined various organizations, again, German language ones, because that was a way to expand the field. And I started to make these full conference maps. This is an early one. And so you notice the structure, right? There are these three lines, and there's a dot in the middle. And that was something that began to repeat. So there's one very explicitly so. And so at these conferences now, it was actually built in that I would meet with people after the conference was over, maybe on the, left, um, the morning after the conference, we would discuss and say, this is what I heard, do you think this was the topic, is it going there? And then now and then they were published in literature that came out later. So this, both the image behind, these are actually people having um, early prints of the material in front of them. Next. And so eventually I came up with this instrument that I called the fractal three-line matrix. I realized that this is in a way a picture of my brain. I was thinking about each, it's, it's a very simple way. I'm sure philosophers do these things all the time, but I kind of self-discovered this. So if I'm thinking of the three most important topics in any text, right, a conference is a text, that's the large one. I don't want them to be hierarchically. I intersect them so I can spin them. They have outlined topics, so I give the ends of these axes names, and then I can fractally expand this. And as I'm doing this, the left and the right kind of gives me these stacks, so that has names. So I'm having a lot of fun creating or applying this to um, a variety of materials. I even do it with students now who are developing their thesis work. Um, it's actually applicable to a lot of materials. Next. But then something really, really, really strange happened. I went back home, my dad had died recently, I went through you know, material, I found a box with my artwork. That thing on the left is a Christmas ornament, it's a straw star, which I made as a child, you know, four year old, five year old, and it looks the same, right? It has the same shape, and it has a string in the middle, right? My matrix always had to have the spiral for you know, depth and indication of three dimensions and movement. It gets stranger next. <laughs> Along with that thing, there were collages I had made. So my mom always had me do childhood artwork, right? So we had straws. So I took the straw and I made a collage, how to make a straw star. And then the thing next to it, and they were like archeologically in the layers of the box, right? 
to the one on the right, I had written a letter, like, to dear mom, with my name, like, in the center. So it kind of looks the same, right? So I had to take this really hard sit down. It's like, what happened? So the matrix, I don't mind saying this, the things we are, I'm five. There's a really long time in between, right next to here. <laughs> so this is the question, of course. What is my achievement? Have I done anything but kind of like unearth the layers of my brain? Is, you know, making Christmas ornaments what made me who I am? And so I wrote this text and tried to work through it. So I looked at the, you know, gal had these great, great ideas. And you can find it, by the way, on my website if you want to look. It's written in a very strange way. It's um, a ring composition. So more strange things happen as I was writing this. So I had to think about this. Um, what I wanted to do as I wrote this last sentence here, I wanted to look for other ways of finding continuity in what I was thinking, what I was doing, and that was to relate experiences to work by others across disciplines. I had to work with other people. And that had actually started already, but I wanted to make it more intense. So the third cycle then is I am looking at what I call epistemic engines, how other people know, or so actually the, the presumption is, right, this matrix is how I know, so it's my epistemic engine. So I want to look at other epistemic engines. Out of this came a thing called the brain and the idea of performative diagrammatics, which is what I call my work now. Next. So this started um, at a residency in Bend when people made me or invited me to their studios. Then there was a break where it like did um, studio conversation mapping with students. And then at a sabbatical, so again, I mentioned these things because these external circumstances are really very, very important to when you have time to think, how you think with others, how things can happen in context. So I happened to get a grant to go to Vienna and um, I knew people in arts administration at the University of Munich in performing arts and they connected me to experimental musicians. And I started in Vienna to have these in-depth conversations with conversations with musicians, and they all started with the question, how do you work? And I didn't need to know what they were doing, I didn't need to understand their discipline, I didn't even need to hear anything, it was just about how are they able to bring their embodied knowing into language, and how did we do this in similar ways across disciplines, and we all do it in very similar ways. So I'm showing you some images here of people I um, interacted with in Chicago, I think you'll find the jazz scene here, you probably know them, um, Ken Vandermark. And so I would always make this very informal drawing or diagram, and then I would take the material and map it onto the matrix. And the artists were often more interested in the informal drawings, they recognized themselves in this, so the matrix was my exercise. And then I asked them in return to improvise on this. Basically the idea is if I can discern your epistemic engine, can you use it as a compositional device? And does this double down on how you work? Um, next. So I did an uh, example with Kim Tariq where if you weren't in my studio, we were in a residency at the Roger Brown House, so I just drew this thing out, so it doesn't matter, right? I don't need to see them. Which, um, and then um, also I started to make these um, overlay images, right? I really had fun playing with Photoshop. So they were these iterations, right? Conversation, notes, drawing, another conversation, feedback music, then I would document it. And so it, the, the, the iterative part was really important. I didn't understand it. Recently it makes more sense to me, but I really felt the need to keep going, 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 going. Next. Um, James Paul Zellman in my studio. My studio has really good acoustics, by the way, <laughs> which I had in Norway, so all those guys showed up. Um, next. Um, this is with a visual artist, um, Jim Degnan, and so he was drawing on his material as a feedback, which I have to say to work with a musician is more meaningful in these contexts, so it was something that worked out better for the project and still would like the result. Next. What came out of this after a really long time was that I realized that everybody told me the same things. So this now goes beyond the epistemic engine piece. Um, maybe one thing to mention, I was totally exhausted. I had talked to maybe 40, 45 people in depth. I could not wrap my hand, head around somebody else's <laughs> epistemic engines anymore. It was too much. Um, the, the first ones were really fast. It went harder. And 
And so I began to summarize what I heard. And what came out of it was everybody talks about how they make things, right? Um, like an example is somebody told me, I sat under my parents' piano at the vibration to make the needle of contact mic later on. So very, very straightforward story. Everybody talks about how they have to mediate their material. You know, artists have to write statements. You have to, in order to find funding, in order to find venues, you have to be able to be in conversation with peers, with gatekeepers, with many different people. How do you work with this conversation, right? There is reflection, there is the notion of critique, what is criticality. And then the last piece that very few people talked about intentionally was how do you manage your life? How do you manage what you make? Not your career. <laughs> there is this assumption that other people should do it and that artists don't know. But artists know this incredibly, incredibly well. And actually, that was so interesting working with the musicians. Musicians rely more on self-organizing than visual artists who still have this dream that they will be discovered and go to the museum. <laughs> Not so much anymore, um, but self-organizing around musicians who had to get each other paid, who had to take care of each other in a way, you know, to throwing an event like this is, is part of that. That was something that was very, very clear. They would lead organizations and that made it particularly clear to me. So what I had tried to do was to create this construct that was supposed to be topological and it can twist and turn. So if you look at you know managing, you might have to deal with this for the whole week. And so that gets really, really big. And then you get to make something. So you're rehearsing, you're in your you know, space, you do your own thing. That might be something that can expand then. So that's why these mini donuts are there. That all moves around. Um, next, please. So what this served was that this could now work with other people to tell their own stories. I didn't need to do it anymore. So I invited, again, like 35 people from my studio. Actually, I did not. One of my students volunteered, and she invited everybody, which is also super important. And so we had people come through. I got a little grant, so we have videos of it. And so there are, I think, 25 videos or so on video of people having these conversations. And they are really intriguing. They were very different people we invited. And there was one group of fairly well-to-do hobby artists. And so they said, I'm not interested in the brain. I just want the pretzel. So the pretzel is just this part, right? I don't need to manage. And then the body language was really great as people talked to it because they kept repeating it. They kept doing this. This is really happening. We're actually doing these things, right? And my next step was coming out of um, a constraint uh, being invited to an exhibition that ended up not happening, where there was no money, no shipping, no electricity, <laughs> really nothing. And so I said, what can I put into a suitcase where I can still do a break? So we put it on the ground at this little workshop and lab in the studio. And as we started to walk the break, our minds shifted. And we became slower, we became more empathetic. And there was this really clear realization that if we talk vertically, to avoid using words <laughs> to each other, there is um, a distance there that is not the same as if we're walking like this, looking at each other. And so the empathy and the warmth and the understanding that grew out of this was truly amazing. Right? And it didn't have to be large either. So I made bracelets and little pieces so they can be handed out. And so that's when this term performative diagrammatics came about. It's I'm doing diagrams, but the performance is actually has always been an important part. I mean, even with the light installations back then, even when people were walking above, uh, across my sculptures and I didn't understand why. So I always have invited people to perform, but only then did I understand why the performance was actually crucial to the work before I just had kind of cracked it. And the interesting thing was, so this all branches off of each other all the time, right? This braid then became an instrument just like the three line matrix had been. So I was able to connect it to text. So in honor of the connection to Northwestern, one of the really intriguing notions was that Calderwood in his text on methodology, the short piece, which is really beautiful, actually used the same alliteration game I did, 
where um, he said you have critiqued citizen citizenship and criticality. And he went through others like activism, artistry, and um, forgot what the other one was. Um, so that felt, that was the next eerie thing that that happened, right? Actually, I taught there in his last year just for a while, but as he lamented the silos we were in, we, ne we never came across each other. Even though I threw performances on the campus, but that was a big deal, right? We would do it. So there is now the brave instrument that has grown into this. Next. And I can map anything on these things, right? So I'm using it with text. There's a jury piece. So I was thinking and that this, in a way, is the answer to the question for today, right? How do we map our stories out? If everybody deals with these areas, if this seems to be, um, how, I don't know, I don't want to say like a human constant, but definitely in Western culture, and I've actually found that it truly is a constant. Um, if you're going back to Thomas Kuhn's History of Scientific Revolutions, he actually invents the term paradigm, and these are paradigmatic areas. Mm -hmm. So I also now, I, I wrote a piece called, like, thanks, um, to another sabbatical and the pandemic about the break where I'm beginning to speak about this, but um, I'm super intrigued in looking into this further. Next. So the next piece then becomes, so I have diagrammatic instruments. I feel great about them, but I learned something walking the break that I want to explore more, and I did that with others. So the next cycle that's going on right now and was disrupted by the pandemic, except the writing for the voices were great. The next cycle consists of co-creating diagrammatic instruments and co-created and become facilitators. And Ben is one of the co-creators of one of those pieces. Next. So the first one I'm showing you really super briefly is called performative topologies. And Bob over there, my partner, was heavily involved in this um, to um, working with digital and um, coding, digital means and coding. And so we were able to make really amazing pieces and that happened in part because some of the co-creators there were my students, they couldn't see my digital collages anymore. They said, <laughs> we need actually the next cutting edge, th edge thing in order to move that, I said, I just you know, know the right person to do it and so we did. Next please. So some of the work happened in my studio, some of it happened um, at a residency I had at the Bath University of Weimar, the Silvano University Technology Lab, um, where with Bob I had started to work with a 3D camera and they had tracking devices there, so we, we played um, with a variety of materials. So this is the back end of the piece. And to me, the back end, how it's made, is as important as what comes out next. This is um, actually from, from the piece I just published. This is the scheme of how it works. So we actually developed a series of prompts so there are prompts. Based on the prompts, people engage in individual movements, and the prompts have to be do with um, eliciting memory. And the movements are then recorded by a 360 camera, um, manipulated with um, Bob's software, to in a way look like the brain again, right? It's another torus. So now we have people in the torus doing their own thing, but not reflexive intellectually, but actually looking in their own thinking. And so this shows how this transposition is being done. Next. And this is in a gallery in Berlin where we went through these exercises. So there's just a small projection in the back, a camera in the middle, and people are in their own movements. And there's something very intriguing that happens when people do these things. It's they are doubling in a way. They are present to each other, but they are also present to their own iterations of their movements. And this creates a very beautiful, dense atmosphere that in a way goes back to this idea of epistemic diversity. People thinking differently and knowing differently, but doing it together and noticing each other and doing it non-judgmentally because the stakes are super low. It's just a memory of one thing they have. Next. So the next one, that's the last um, set of three images, the micro practices for inner gentleness. Um, the title is coming from a Guattari um, text, next. And um, here we explicitly try to work with the idea of critique. Um, in art school, studio critique is often something that's contentious, aggressive, but there are also really beautiful things that have happening in there that have to do with uh, performativity. So we went 
through various readings and then practice critiques to try to figure out what the elements were that make a good critique or, in the end, a good conversation. And so we used the camera, we used movement, we used the blade, um, and we developed um, 18 prompts with associated electrical thread. These are the prompts, and then these are the figures. We developed, and it was actually then one other person and I just one day in the studio, and this, this is the beauty of this way of working together. There is intentionality, but what happens seems like magic. It just occurs if you know when it's right and when it's not right. And that is the process I, I can't wait to work with again as soon as it becomes possible. Next. And this is um, one of only three iterations before we all were shut down in uh, Mexico City at an art book fair um, where it really was a magical event where people interacted with each other, reacted to the prompts. Um, and so I, I have this memory of, you know, a little bit over a year ago <laughs> and um, can't wait to work with this um, again, actually try it out in various locations. And there are things lined up, they just have to become possible again. And this was it. So the whole point of this was really a very, what seems serendipitous, but really is, is a story of making something built on top of each other. And I was thinking when I saw your prompt, right? <laughs> it's being a different generation, come being, being um, educated in a different context. I never thought about having to be original. I never mm -hmm. thought about um, having to have a career. Um, I needed to eat, I needed a studio. Um, there was a lot of precarity and a lot of freaking out <laughs> in between until that settled into its, its current form. So it just didn't start so early, right? There was the middle time when the precarity um, was starting. But these things seem to happen in spite of everything else. And the most important thing and what I found hardest was to find allies along the way because this does not fit in any discipline. I don't have a language that connects well with people. I actually intentionally emigrated because I didn't want to take things for granted or be taken for granted. And so all these experiences together made sense and are making work I am very intrigued by. And it just took a while to get there. So thank you. I mean that that's you know wow that was that was that was a lot of fun I had a lot of fun thank you all